You can listen to The Professional Left on iTunes, Stitcher Radio, or at our website, ProLeftPod.com, where you can also contribute to this podcast. There's a PayPal button at our website, or you can mail us a letter and or contribution at P.O. Box 9133, Springfield, Illinois, 62791. This is the podcast for December 29th, 2017. It's not safe for work. Coming to you live from the home of the soft reboot of Science Fiction University, it's The Professional Left with Drift Glass and Blue Gal. And so at the end of this episode of The Professional Left podcast, we're going to have a special end-of-year Science Fiction University during which Drift Glass will be... Providing massive spoilers. I will be spoiling the shit out of The Last Jedi. The Last Jedi. So if you don't want to hear that, just turn it off. But turn we won't do it before we we will make a, a hard break and you will know. Yes. Starting Science Fiction University. And uh, I'm looking forward to hearing what you have to say. And I might talk about the, the Republican Party as Jurassic Park. I think it's uh, long enough after Jurassic Park was produced. Oh, yeah. You don't need to film. worry about that. You can talk but about that right now because that's oh. probably timely for the political part of the show. Right? Yeah, I believe it would be. So Jurassic Park was a movie produced a number of years ago. Mm-hmm. <laughs> and it was about a billionaire who created an, an island full of monsters. Mm-hmm. Who genetically engineered an island full of monsters. And every sequel after that was about people who just couldn't fucking leave it alone. Who just couldn't leave it alone. You know what? If we just tweak a little bit, if we just change it a little bit, if we just figure out what the security protocols should be, if we just bring in new staff, because we, we spent a shit ton of money on this thing, and, it's, and it's, it's a mess. So what we need to do is not nuke it from space, because that would be wrong. We need to figure out how to make this crazy terrible idea pay for itself Mm -hmm. to make it work so we'll just keep tweaking it and the latest um iteration of this in the republican party are the uh the never trumpers um who are very clearly uh based on two articles i read this week uh one by connor friedersdorfer on the atlantic and uh one uh, i don't think it's dorfer i think it's just connor friedersdorf yeah i I prefer connor (laughs) friedersdorf oh you're just making that up i see Um, i'm sorry (laughs) um and uh sam tan tan uh in in esquire uh the the one in esquire and i'll go into them in in greater detail we'll we'll provide you links but i i I plan to write these up because they're such a rare they're so clear what the this is the floor plan of the lifeboat building operation lifeboats, the Party. yeah yeah and drift glass did say to me yesterday he said stop the presses we don't need any notes this week we're just going to do a riff riff tracks right yes riff yes. tracks of connor friedersdorf's article yes and then i went you... and looked at it and i looked at what charlie pierce had to say about it yes I was like, what part of the entire Republican Party is responsible for Trump do you not understand? Yeah. Yes, it's it's pretty. Um, and you really do kind of uh, want to read these two if you want to read them at all. I, I, you might not want to waste your time. Um, sort of as binocular lenses to understand sort of the depth and range of what it is you're looking at. The um, Esquire article is all about this book launch party. That took place uh, at David Frum's house. Uh, David Frum, who's apparently independently wealthy, uh, deep in the article, it said he didn't really need the money he was getting from the uh, think tanks, et cetera, et cetera. But it's it's all of the people you would suspect uh, who were all gathered around in kind of this mournful uh, celebration of a book release because book parties are very important to these people. Um, but it was it was all the folks. It was da- it was Gerson and David Brooks and all the rest of them who were. Who are all these people who who were going to form the nucleus of this new thing? And they're all they're all sort of like shell shocked that the Republican Party turned out to be exactly what liberals said it was all along. Um, but it was this sort of detailed, incestuous description of um, all these people know each other, and and all the you know all your favorite liberals were there too because it was a. DC party and everybody goes. I learned one thing uh, is that Andrew Sullivan is now a liberal, <laughs> a liberal editorial writer. Uh, I didn't realize that. I didn't realize that uh, you could just flip a switch and, and declare him to be a liberal. But they, the, the author put him in with David Korn and Jane Mayer as a liberal writer of opinions. So now Andrew Sullivan, much to my shock, uh, is to my left, which mm-hmm. is weird. Mm-hmm. Um, but it, it was this really detailed um, description of the sort of inbred incredibly elite, incredibly insulated group of conservative public intellectuals 
who are completely freaked out that the Republican Party turned out to be Jurassic Park, turned out to be a, an island full of monsters, turned out to be exactly what liberals have been telling them it, it was all this time. At no point in the article is there any acknowledgement that liberals are right. At no point in the article is there any acknowledgement that liberals even exist other than to acknowledge that all your favorite liberals were there too because it's D.C. and everybody is fucking everybody else or everybody knows everybody else or everybody goes to each other's house. It's But it's this um, ecosystem mm -hmm. of the media that – and this explains why there will never be an end to articles about poor, working class, economically distressed, white, Midwest Trump voters mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. because none of these people – have ever met any such creature in their life at all. <laughs> they have no idea who the Republican Party is, who the base is, what's made up about it. So they send they they live on a different planet and they send out little safaris into the into the dark continent, into the interior, the mysterious interior of this country about which they have been writing for 10, 15, 20, 30 years with great authority and great confidence about what's going on and who the Republicans are and what they believe. And it turns out they don't know anything about the Republican Party. So they dispatch these little little uh, little groups that go out and find uh, the last the last uninterviewed redneck in America to tell it, to tell them exactly the same story <laughs> that they've been repeating among themselves. And and they, and they come back and they go, oh my God, I found one. There was a diner. It was a place called, I believe, Sister Fuck Arkansas. Yeah. I'd only heard about it in Legend, but but there was someone there. And that is the um, Esquire article. Uh, the Connor Friedersdorf, I, I'll, I'll say it correctly from now on, article is all about, and here's the headline, Never Trump will be the only faction still standing when he's gone. <laughs> Subtitle, when the Republican Party's current coalition falls apart, those who stood up to bigotry will be the only ones with the credibility to rebuild. Da, wow. da, da, da. Wow. And, and this is ab absolutely 100% what we have been predicting and saying and and shouting and shooting up flares uh, all along. Of course, they're going to do this. Of course, mm -hmm. it's this is not. They're go, they're going to declare that they had nothing to do with this. Uh, they're going to declare that this all started 18 months ago. Uh, that it was a this is a black swan event. Uh, that they had nothing to do with it. That this that this political party that produces monsters by design which they have profited from, which which has paid for their homes and their kids' colleges and their second houses and their mistresses and their wives and their travel. This great, horrifying machine that, ha that, that, that has profited them personally for decades. They're going to say they had nothing to do with it. Yep. They were never there. It wasn't us. We never believed in any of this shit. We were completely flummoxed and, and, and shocked when we discovered the Republican Party was full of Republicans – and now we are truly the only people because by virtue of being completely fucking ignorant of everything that we're paid to know about, we are the only people who are credible enough to rebuild the Republican Party. Yep. One last point. Uh, Connor Friedersdorf's uh, article appears in The Atlantic. David Frum is a senior editor at The Atlantic. Mm -hmm. so, so I would imagine at some point this passed through his colon. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and it was approved of by him. Now, I might be wrong. Maybe it's the same relationship that, that the New York Times has with David Brooks, which is we never read anything he writes because he doesn't write for us. He writes for a clutch of ultra wealthy shut in morons on the Upper East Side. Mm -hmm. And we, we don't care what he says because it, it isn't relevant to us because everything out beyond the Hudson doesn't matter. We don't give a shit about that. So whatever he writes, as long as he's making our billionaire friends happy and comforting college professors and – and other people who don't ever have to go out in the world, um, we're fine with that. But that's what you're seeing right now. This is happening right now, right in front of us, um, all day, every day. There are uh, myriad stories that go on, and, and we'll talk about that in a little bit. But um, that's where I want to sort of start us off this week. Well, and I wanted to point out that one of my projects for this week, while the kids are out of town and, you know, it's between Christmas and New Year's, mm -hmm. um, we are doing at Crooks and Liars our annual Crookie Awards, and it's, you know, the worst of the year and the best of the year. We're also going over our top 10 most watched videos at the website, Crooks and Liars. Everybody and you should have go done, to CrooksandLiars.com. 
<laughs> and you have you have worn out at four hazmat suits that I know of. I have just doing just doing the Kellyanne Conway post. Right, that took me all afternoon and really going through everything from uh, you know not just the microwaves are recording you and the Bowling Green Massacre, <laughs> you know yeah. those kind of really <laughs> insane things. Yeah. Just in her interviews, um, the the time when Donald Trump. Uh, tweeted about uh, Mika Brzezinski and right. said, uh, you know, bleeding on her face and it was disgusting and so forth, which is just his way of treating women that he doesn't like or that have pushed up against him in terms right. of power. I don't mean that sexually. No. Uh, the the um, thing that she said at that point was, I wish the media would stop covering Donald Trump's tweets. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Not that I work for a misogynist no, asshole no, racist monster. No. Like why can't why do we need why can't we just uh you know go along with uh who the man really is on the inside? <laughs> mm -hmm. But right. we're going over this the team is nominating people. I threw out an email and said, "Come on everybody, you know, give me your ideas about who's the best and worst of 2017." And we had an interesting discussion about whether to include Republicans on the good list, you know, because there are some people like Richard Painter who has called out Trump from the beginning on ethics violations and and very clearly said, look, he is in violation of the emoluments clause. He's in violation of all these things and um, clearly is is very worried about Donald Trump. And uh, Steve Schmidt was the other one that was brought up mm -hmm. as being somebody who has been, you know, very unforgiving of Trump, very articulate in uh, dissing tr Donald Trump and his administration sure. and where the Republican Party is and how the Republican co Congress is enabling him and so forth. Mm -hmm. And what I said, sort of editorially talking with the team about this, is to my mind, the different, there's a difference between Richard Painter and Steve Schmidt. Yes. Um, <laughs> and the, that difference is that Steve I feel as though Steve Schmidt would be happy to take a paycheck to get the next Jeb Bush elected. Absolutely. Or, or Marco Rubio or, or Marco, Ted Cruz. Or any, well, any, anyone yeah. who is sort of, mm -hmm. uh, you know, a good guy Republican who's going to come in and cut taxes and limit the power of unions and, and all of the things that Donald Trump is actually doing in terms of pro-Israel, screw the State Department, America is running, going to run the world from where they are the way they want. Uh, screw the U.N. I mean, screw the U.N., let's face it. <laughs> you know, yeah. that's John Bolton territory. That is that's not... John, that's John Birch territory. Yeah, that is not uh, foreign to the Republican Party no. at all. No. And so I don't uh, I, I don't have a problem saying, okay, Richard Painter, yeah, I, I appreciate his contribution to the conversation. Mm -hmm. Steve Schmidt, yes, I appreciate his contribution to the conversation, but make no mistake, I know where Steve Schmidt's bread is buttered. Oh, right? yeah. I know. Oh, absolutely. Yep. So I, I can't give him a pass. Uh, the other thing that I wanted to bring up about this whole um, best and worst thing mm -hmm. is it really did come to me how compressed time is this year. Yeah. And how all of us really, you know, we check in with each other every podcast Mm -hmm. We really, I, I pray and hope and, and my thoughts are with our listeners. Everybody, please, for my sake, <laughs> make a New Year's uh, goal of self-care. Yes. <laughs> Take time out. Turn off Twitter for a day, one day a week. Uh, get sleep if you can. Enjoy your, your family and your partners and your hobbies and get outdoors. And, I, you know, this is why I think you and I wanted to do a little science fiction university today, too, is it is important to take a break every once in a while. That doesn't mean you're normalizing. That doesn't mean you're not concerned. That doesn't mean you have you don't have your shoulder to the grindstone most of the time. Exactly. But you cannot. We we cannot afford to have any of us burn out at this point. Um. And that's and I I want to say that to everybody out there because we need you as much as you need us. So mm -hmm. that's it. Well, what do you want to do next, Drift Glass? Do you want to go through the news roundup and? I let me let me um just for the uh, first of all I do want to mention <clears throat> that everyone should go check out Friend Botocchio. Yes. And the the Jonathan Swift annual roundup that he does every year. Every year and it is at Vagabond Scholar. If you Google Vagabond Scholar, mm -hmm. uh, you can go over. Batocchio puts together uh, the best posts, the best liberal posts of the year, as nominated by the bloggers themselves, mm -hmm. in honor of the old blogger old school blogger, Jonathan yes. Swift. The late great. Uh, the late great. And uh, I'm so glad that Batocchio has picked up that mantle and continues it to this day. 
We'll we'll include a link um, at at our yeah my post and yeah we'll do that yeah but it, it's it's Yeoman's work and it, it is a real callback to the old days of blogging the the history of your um, it's only ten years ago kids I know I know <laughs> <clears throat> but really it's it is um it is amazing to me as I as I say almost every week on this podcast how much of the past just fucking evaporates yeah. uh, when it comes to politics how people just mm-hmm. vaporize uh, decades. Of everything, it's it's mm-hmm. it, it is. Um, I, I've likened it to about six different Doctor Who episodes, I'm sure. Mm-hmm. But it, it is it. Is, I, I I believe last time I used the silence as a um uh, a Doctor Who enemy uh, who screws with you and controls your mind, and when you turn away, you forget about it. Mm-hmm. That's mm-hmm. his magic power, and it it part of what our job is, as I've said many times before, on the left is to is to do what the Irish did. Um, you know, during during the time when Europe was collapsing. Um, it fell to the Irish to copy books yeah, yeah. and keep knowledge alive. It really mm-hmm. – I mean, knowledge is dying all around us, not all over the world. Um, but in this country, um, the, the media and the, and the Republican Party are going down into the dark together mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. and, and it, because they, can, they have to, because they can't bear to look back. They can't bear to see how they got to where they are because if they did, um, they'd all have to pay a horrifying price for it. They're, they're, none of them would have a job. None of them would yep. have a house. Yep. Uh, they'd be they'd be driven out of polite society. Um, but instead of that, we get Joan Walsh being, you know, cashiered over at MSNBC because the ideological makeup of the of the network apparently can't bear to have her uh, uh, screwing up the salary cap that allows them to employ Hugh Hewitt, right. and Joe Scarborough, and the people who are who are the Scarboroughs and the Hewitts of the world are dedicated to snuffing out any recollection of anything that happened before Donald Trump came down the escalator. Yep. Uh, yep. Their survival depends on it. So I, I did a, a quick post today, and I want to run through the the theme of it to launch us into our news roundup, if you don't mind, Blue Gal. No, that's fine. And I have one thing I want to add, too. That, um, sure. the, uh, someone brought up to me, um, you know, optimism versus pessimism, and uh-huh. was saying that, you know, we didn't have a Fox News 25 years ago. <laughs> and and this this thought that there are members of Congress actively engaging in obstructive obstruction of justice right now. Yes. Uh, you know, diminishing the the power of the FBI in the media by mm-hmm. and, and denigrating them in the media, uh, trying to interrupt the investigation. Uh, Devin Nunes, you know, is absolutely interfering yes. uh, in the ability to which which is so ironic given their total dependence on congressional investigations mm-hmm. that the Republican Party had to win. against Hillary Clinton to win. Yeah. That's the only reason they won was witch yeah. hunt after witch hunt after witch yep. hunt. And yep. Devin Nunez, who recused himself, who said, I'm and not going to get... And now interfering again. <clears throat> I mean, is... yep. he needs to be removed from the committee and and uh, and all of the distractions that Donald Trump is engaged in. And, and the media just goes off and chases one thing after another. And who's and, the person... And... And the person in charge of removing people like Devin Nunez would be Paul Ryan. And Paul Ryan's answer is always he shrug his shoulders and look off into the middle distance and take the next question. Right. And right. he needs to be fucking crucified by the media. Yep. yep. And they're not going to do it. Yep. yep. So I'm sorry. They're I interrupted. Yeah, no, no, that's all right. But that's that's the point. Mm-hmm. Uh, but the, the point the point that this correspondent was making is, look. There, there was no Fox News. There was no kind of relationship between the media and the Republican Congress the way there is today of this self-feeding. And I said, wait a minute. Uh, you need to go back and watch a lot of Frank Capra movies <laughs> yep. because I don't think we are at all aware or that we at all remember mm-hmm. the power of big newspapers. The Hearst back, newspapers. Right. Mm-hmm. Back in the 40s and 30s and so forth. Um, newspapers and radio were mainstream media, where that, that was yeah. where people got their news. And you will see inevitably in a Frank Capra movie or in a, in, in Frank Capra wannabe movies, because there uh, were plenty of those, too. Uh-huh. Uh, there is always a scene where the newspaper men are getting together. Yeah. And the newspaper editor's in a big office with a big desk and says, oh, you know, we're the Tribune and the Herald is going to pay for this. And the, we're going to tell the mayor that such and such. And it's clear that what is being done is politics. Yes. And it's not informing the public. No. <laughs> it's it's <clears throat> manipulating the public either for the mayor or against the mayor. And, oh, look, this is, you know, uh, Junior Dude and I watched uh, Meet John Doe. Yes. 
And great movie. You know, the the newspaper men are meeting and they say, no, this is a shot across the bow to the governor. And this is a shot across the bow to the mayor. And this is and you see it. It They are clearly manipulating the news in order to get votes. That's all they're doing. And mm-hmm. the fact that Frank Capra and, and other directors knew they had to include a slap, a smack, a smashdown of that world in their movie shows how important it was. So I don't think that uh, I, I agree with people that are say that like you, Drew Glass, who say we can't this nation cannot long endure half Fox and half free. Right. And the Fox News has to go because has to go. Has they to are go. they are a, a lying. They're an active <laughs> fifth column. Lying. They're an right. active fifth column exactly. menace to this. Society. They're menace, not part of the free yeah. press. They're not no. part of the First Amendment. They're a, they're an internal enemy. Of this country, acti- o- operating in the open for profit uh, to destroy the country that mm-hmm. we all love, mm-hmm. and that is that is their mission and goal. And the any if you work at Fox News, sorry, you're complicit. Yep. If you're a cameraman at Fox News, sorry, go find an honest job doing something somewhere else. Yep. Uh, yep. Because you it, you are the problem, mm-hmm. and mm-hmm. I don't care that you're just greasing the, the the wheels of the train that's hauling us all off to oblivion. That that's your job. Quit yep. that job. It's an evil yep. job. You're working for evil people. Stop doing it. Mm-hmm. And the fact that you won't do it, well, you're, you're complicit. Well, you're complicit. Yeah. That's it. And and if you're gonna go watch a movie tonight about the newspaper industry, mm-hmm. go rent His Girl Friday. Yeah, yeah, it's, same it's thing. The power of the press. The power of the, the press, power... and it, and it's the same thing. It's you know hiding uh, a convicted murderer right. <laughs> in a desk, right? Uh-huh. Uh, for a story. For a story. Yeah, but and, and the, there's no there are no heroes in this story. They're no, all no, yeah. a, operating at an angle. But the the people, the con men, the the sort of pickpockets and and nefarious characters that the newspaper people are are wired into are by and large trying to help the little guy mm-hmm. and hold people in power accountable. Mm-hmm. Um, and they're not saints. <laughs> they're not noble. They're they're doing it for really kind of very conflicted reasons, but they're the good guys, and you mm. shouldn't expect you know th- this was when the press was were working class, you know they were right. working class people. They were not people who lived in the fucking Acela corridor and never met a working class person in their goddamn life except to drop off their car to have their oil changed, or just or to freak out and and sprint across the country for two weeks. Because Donald Trump just won, and suddenly my my boss wants to know how the fuck you didn't catch this, David. Mr. Brooks, you know, uh, Mr. Schulzberger would like to see you. He'd like to know how you didn't notice that the Republican Party had gone completely fucking mad. And that was that two-week period or three-week period when David Brooks swore, swore on the lives of his children that he would go out into the world and discover what was going on there. Because I've spent too much time at college campuses and inside the bubble. I must have missed something. And by Jiminy, I'm going to go find these people and figure them out. Well, that that day has passed now. Now we're on to the... You know what? The same assholes who brought you the Bush administration, the same assholes who, who, who sat on their hands as the Republican Party obstructed and denied and committed acts of overt sedition against Barack Obama for eight fucking years and why that Barack Obama was to blame because he wasn't leading them. The same people who cheered on Clinton impeachment and then sat quietly as George Bush lied us into war are the same people who are now building another lifeboat. Right. So they and their rich fucking friends who have never done an honest day's job in their life uh, can sail off once again uh, and never have any of this touch them, never have this, as as the mayor used to say of the city of Chicago, never had this mud, mud splash on them mm-hmm. and go right on with their very privileged, happy little lives and never have to worry about the rest of us getting fucked because – somehow this is our media. Yeah. These rich, insulated assholes are the people in charge of bringing us the truth. Well, you said that this morning to me, and I thought that was very revealing about why so many, at one after the other, stories about uh, disaffected or not disaffected Trump voters in the yes. hinterlands, right? Yes. And we're seeing one after another after another. Oh, look at these Trump voters. They still love him. Oh, look at these Trump voters. Oh, my God. They're mm-hmm. scared and disappointed. Oh, look at these Trump voters. They don't know yet. Or one of them says he voted. For... The ones that say they voted for Obama in 08 and voted for Trump this time around, uh, I I have no time for at all. No, I mean, no. They're, they're not to be taken seriously. No. But uh, you had, I mean, that you just answered part of it, but you had that really good explanation of how responsible New York City and Washington, D.C. and that whole eastern seaboard uh, sense of 
uh, specialness. Very special. You They're know, special. Uh, the, the, the exemption that the Eastern Seaboard has from unemployment, oh, yeah. from poverty, from the standpoint of that world, that, that lobbyist media government world that just pastes right over any real problems because they money. will never they will never be unemployed this yep. none of this cabal will ever ever miss a meal ever right, right, uh, right it doesn't matter how badly they fuck up they will protect each other and and all of those stories about you know this is this is, i make this joke you know probably to the point of tedium but you know we're sitting on our porch watching the you know beltway media zeitgeist action van <laughs> Zipping yeah. past us in every direction, looking for those white, disaffected, working class, um, church going mm -hmm. Trump voters. I'm like, well, we're all of those things except for the Trump part. Mm -hmm. And by the way, we won. We, you know, we there are three million more of us than them. And no one is interested in talking to us yeah. at all. Yeah. Nobody wants to hear about the white, working class, church going, middle class, middle American, middle aged people who think Donald Trump is a fucking monster and always have. Because that's not a story. That's well, not because that doesn't feed into the um, zoo like uh, yeah, yeah. image of middle America. Oh, this is, is but yeah, the image that flashes to my mind is um, ships sent to the New World bringing back exotic plants and animals right, right. for the queen to look at. Right. You know, right. And this one was captured on the coast of what we call Virginia. <laughs> and look, it's it's a native of the country. And here's a tobacco plant. And they like this thing called tobacco. And it really is just this sort of the oddities of this completely unexplored territory called mm -hmm. the United States mm -hmm. that these fuckers have never visited in their lives and have no idea about. Uh, they, they tell each other stories about it. They pass, as I've said before, pass around stories about, about real America like, like, uh, like a dirty postcard. Well, uh, I think I think that does go both ways in that I do wish that the all, every voter of Iowa could yeah. be given a free trip to Europe for oh, yeah. you know ten for days a year. for a year. Yeah, go, go, go travel live there. Go live in Scandinavia for a year and tell us come back and tell us what it's like. They'd all be liberals. By yes, that they would. Time. <laughs> oh my God! You go to the doctor, you break a leg, and you come back, and everything's fine, and you're not right, bankrupt. Right. And you're you're and you get paid, are you know, paid for. You pay a very yes. high marginal tax rate, but you know what? You live in comfort, and you're basically um, you can move from job to job, and and you don't have this oppressive weight of dread yep. uh, that any little thing can can completely destroy your world. Um, and so the 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 high level view of this that I want to use to sort of leap us into the news roundup is the, the post I wrote today, because that's, you know, hey, why not bring the post I wrote today? <laughs> but just, here's the thing. There are four basic stories in American political news that you now hear all the time repeated. Now, now here's, the, here's the trick. One of these stories completely undercuts the other three. Mm. Um, it is, I'll, I'll proceed. The first story is always, oh my God, can you believe what an unhinged racist con man Trump is? Mm-hmm. There's this constant look of just, I can't believe he's gone this far. Will he fire Mueller? Well, well, that would be a bridge too far. But, you know, he's done so many horrible things so far. These are people who said Trump would never win, that, mm -hmm. that he would perform himself, that today he became a president, blah, blah, blah. These are the same people who are perpetually stunned that this tired, bitter, angry, paranoid, racist asshole is just being himself and being a, a perfect reflection of, of his party. They cannot, they can't, that, that, that is such a devastating H-bomb to their worldview, they will not accept it. They're just constantly flummoxed by it. It completely confuses them. That's story number one. Story number two is, can you believe how quickly and completely the entire Republican Party has capitulated to this asshole? They all rolled over. Oh my God, it's like there's no, there's no morally courageous people in the Republican Party. Ask any fucking liberal and we would have told you this 20 years ago. Mm -hmm. Of course, they, they have been selectively breeding out any sense of morality, compassion, competence uh, from the Republican breeding stock for decades. So that's why you have Mitch McConnell running the Senate. And that's why you have Paul Ryan running the House. Soul dead monsters mm -hmm. who are leading a, a, an army of cowards who slash and gut the government on behalf of they're donors and are really open about it. We're here to gut this place on behalf of the billionaires who pay our bills. And we have created a, a party apparatus, a base of the party who are, who are actually dumb enough to not believe we're doing it, even though we're, we're slapping our dick in their face every day. They're just that fucking stupid. Mission accomplished. And that's the third story, which is, 
Can you believe how completely the meathead Republican base have invested themselves personally in Donald Trump? Mm-hmm. And they've come to identify with him so cultishly, so closely, uh, that they simply reject factual reality now. They, they don't even think about it. Causality is gone. Their own history is gone. Everything is fake news, mm-hmm. which every one of the people who does this reporting forgets that, that they did this for George Bush. Yeah, yeah. That they worship right. George Bush right up until George Bush fell apart. So you have three stories. The one story is Donald Trump is a madman. Number two, and the Republic, number two, the Republican Party is completely broken and fucked up and and run by uh, cowards and monsters and losers and racists and scumbags. And number three, the Republican base uh, is cool with all of this. So, so let me guess what story number four is. Take a wild guess what the story, what story number four is, Blue Gal. Uh, both sides are equally bad. Why can't both sides compromise? <laughs> What's wrong with the both sides and the extremes on both sides? And there's never an example of how the Democrats are this way. There's never an example, other than, you know, social justice warriors, which is a magic word covering mm-hmm. everybody. Uh, mm-hmm. They don't even say that anymore. They just press that button and move on because yep. that's the story that makes sure that Chuck Todd doesn't end up in the same rat hole as David Gregory. Yeah. You know, David, I have a podcast now, Gregory. Um, it, it It's what keeps, it's how Chuck Todd and people like him keep their job. Right. They have to go out knowing, and it is epistemologically and ontologically impossible to simultaneously believe that the right really has gone completely nuts, which is exactly what they've been saying all for the last two years. Oh, my God, the, the Republican Party from top to bottom, side to side, is completely out of their fucking minds. And yet the Democrats are somehow equally to blame because we won't meet madness halfway. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. And mm-hmm. and the fact and that's why liberals are not allowed on television. Yeah, well, and and why someone who writes a book called Dead Center gets yes. an instant seat not only on Meet the Press Daily but on Morning Joe. On Morning right? Joe, where he is interviewed by no less a, an authority on alcohol and all things <laughs> historical than Peggy Noonan. Peggy Noonan, who who made a great effort to say, you know what I remember? I remember when I was a little girl drinking a lot, and Daniel Webster, who, who's the great compromiser. He's a great man. And everyone on Twitter said, oh, my God, Peggy, Daniel Webster was the great orator. Henry Clay was the great compromiser. Whoever the intern is who's in charge of keeping Peggy out of the mini bar mm. after reporting <laughs> needs to really up their fucking game. <laughs> because, But it was it was the same sort of hacks and, you know, dead from the neck up uh, a gallery of, of has-beens and nobodies like Mike Barnacle who just sit there. And nod and nod and nod and say, yes, isn't it a shame? Isn't it a terrible shame? How the extremes on both sides. And they know it. Mm-hmm. That's the difference. I, I posted up um, uh, Vernon, I think it was Vernon John's last sermon. Uh, this was the gentleman who, who, was, uh, who, who was the pastor before Martin Luther King was pastor. Ah, okay. And he gave this really fiery speech and then he was arrested. Um, but he, he said, Jesus Christ, his last words were, that, and he said, remember, the, the crucifixion was a lynching. Yep. And yep. the thing that transformed it from a lynching into an act of redemption was Jesus Christ said, forgive them for they know not what they do. And that's what and, and he he said they don't understand what they're doing. So God forgive them. But you know what? Mike Barnacle knows what he's doing. Mm-hmm. And Joe Scarborough knows what he's doing. And Peggy Noonan knows goddamn well what she's doing. They all fucking know what they're doing. And they're doing it on purpose and they're doing it to hurt us and they're doing it to keep their jobs and privilege. Because if if the day ever comes when the big both siders lie falls apart, they're toast. Yeah. They're fucking toast. There's no more time on TV for Peggy. No more Mike Barnacle being treated as anything other than the hack has been. He has been for 20 years. No more work for them. No more Joe Scarborough. It all goes away. So they are they. Every one of these fuckers absolutely knows what they're doing, and they're doing it anyway, and they're doing it on purpose, and they're doing it for money. And mm-hmm. that's what makes the that's what makes all the fucking never Trumpers. With a few rare exceptions, who have actually had the madness refined out of them, who yeah, become a yeah. different person because they recognize what a horrible mistake they've made. I can forgive those people all day long, but the people who straddle the fence and who are building a lifeboat and are saying, "Well, you know, this all happened 18 months ago, had nothing to do with me, but me and my friends are going to fix it because we're going to tweak the the monsters on Jurassic Park version seven, and then it's going to be fucking great." Those are the people who need to go first. Because they're the ones who prop up the rest of the morons on the right. Mm-hmm. And with that, shall we proceed to a news roundup? Sure, go right ahead. Am I am I monopolizing Blue Gallon? No, you're not. No, I'm listening to you. So go right ahead. Let's. You start, and then when I get uh, ready to do it, 
I'd like you to step in on Roy Moore. How's that? Oh, yeah. I need like to step this, in on Roy I'd Moore. like you to step in and go a little bit of Bible bitch on Roy Moore. Sure. Okay. Sure. Mm -hmm. well, I'll do that right now. It but is. Roy Moore, the, the election in Alabama was certified yep. uh, today. And a couple people said, noted on Twitter that Roy Moore sounds like he's about to commit suicide, but that's not the case. Oh. Uh, no, Roy Moore loves himself way too much to do that. But he is uh, calling for the apocalypse because yeah. he wasn't elected. And that's where you need to see this end of days kind of talk. I mean, he is giving end of days talk. Uh, you know, this is God is working his purpose out and we will make sure that that justice reigns. And uh, so help me God, <laughs> that kind of thing. Mm -hmm. uh, he is, uh, ha he has to do this. He has to put up a fight to the beyond the bitter end right. because God wanted him to win. And he told everybody God wanted him to win. That's right. And there are no consequences for Roy Moore no. because God is on his side. And that is the always the uh, way with this kind of Old Testament uh, patriarchal evangelism, which is, uh, you know, it's not by works. It's by faith alone. Jesus uh, chose me. I'm mm -hmm. one of God's chosen people. And it doesn't matter what I do. It doesn't matter how I lived my life. It doesn't matter uh, anything. It's just what matters is that I stand with God and the Ten Commandments, and he's chosen me for patriarchal leadership. Mm -hmm. And um, as you put in our notes, looks like he's been called by God to be an asshole. Yes. <laughs> Not enough uh, assholes in the world. Yeah. And, and, but that, see, and this is something, again, just to step back a little bit, there is the, the area of overlap between Donald Trump and Paul Ryan and, and Roy Moore uh, and all the rest of them are all the same. It's not, yeah. it's not which part of the Bible they lie about or the faith they lie about or, or the, the money that they're taking from people to, to screw over this country and laughing about it. It's that they all know they have to die with the lie. Yeah. They have to commit to the bit. They have to die with the lie. That they have gone all in on this incredibly uh, despicable ideology of theirs this in, or their fake Christianity, and there's no way back for them. There's there are way back there there is a way back for other people, but there is no way that you can walk back your career if you're Roy Moore or or right. or Paul Ryan or Donald right. Trump. You cannot. Right back that truck out of that ditch. You have mm -hmm. to just keep going and keep going and keep going. So, and that's why people who are uh, tiny, insulated beltway creatures are constantly shocked when Donald Trump just lies. Yeah. Like, yeah. don't you fucking get it? That's how he got there. Right, right. It works. And you keep thinking you're going to find someone in there that you can reach. No, the lie, the big pile of lies is all he is. Mm -hmm. There is mm -hmm. nobody left in there. And that's who they are. All of them have become so uh, a, a people of the lie. They, they have they have subsumed their basic psychological structure, their basic personality to 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 the sole purpose of defending a giant lie. But if it ever breaks, will crush them. And it's true of the Republican base who have to believe that they're right, even though it's manifestly true that they're not and will deny objective reality, who will lie about shit they said five minutes ago because the alternative is that you've been wrong all your life, and that would kill them. Mm -hmm. Right up the chain, all these people have gone in on some horrifying lie that, that rationalizes and justifies and, and they believe redeems all the terrible things they've said and done, and they can't back away from it. They can't acknowledge now that they were wrong because it's too late. Yeah. So they're going to yeah. just keep going and going and going until they're stopped, and that's what our job is, Blue Gal, to stop these fuckers. Right. Well, um, and, and we are in the middle of a civil war. Yeah. Uh, one of the things that came to me as I was going over the whole history of this past year with with uh, Kelly and Conway is looking at all of the casualties oh, that God. have happened of career. You know, one third, you have in our notes, 34 percent of senior Trump administration officials have resigned, yep. been fired or uh, been reassigned. Or, it's the or, highest or, first year departure rate of any other administration. But I think this civil war. Uh, actually started with Acorn. Oh, yeah. Started yeah. with Shirley Sherrod. Started with... Uh, James O'Keefe. James O'Keefe. The fact that you could go ahead and fake news your way into destroying a career, mm -hmm. and it worked, and use the mob mm -hmm. on social media to destroy a career. Uh, Kathy Griffin, Al Franken, their careers are over because well, and, of and, the mob. And, and six you years know. later, mm -hmm. you could have... Your you could have James O'Keefe and his fucking Project Veritas yeah. being p 
pimped yep. by Hugh Hewitt yep. on MSNBC as yes. some as a credible thing that you should all pay attention to, and that and that nobody walked in off the stage, grabbed him by the collar, hauled his all his uh, his cyborg from the future sent to destroy America ass off the stage and said, you're never going to work in this industry again. Well, Joanne Reed and Chris Hayes don't have that power. No, but they certainly uh, looked they like... They called him out for it, but yeah. that's all they could do, because he yeah. will still have a job, because that's what... That's how it works. The suits upstairs at MSNBC yeah. want him to have a job. But yeah, he did say, everyone should read the Project Veritas tapes. Really? Yeah. You yeah. know, What's and, going on and, there? Uh, it's, that's, and he, he, he pays, again, he pays no consequence for saying that. Right. And so, that's, uh, that's, that's the common yeah. threat is... And we have a little thing in the note about about Donald Trump golf two days in a row tweeting, I'm back to work. I'm back to work. You know, it's it's a little lie, but it's all lies. It's yeah. all lies. It's all lies every day. And well, it, and and Chris Hayes tweeted about that too. He said, you know, it's it is we we gloss right over it now, but mm-hmm. it is not a little thing to say I'm back to work at the golf course when we can clearly see him golfing. Yeah, and he's and basically he's he's flipping the bird, saying mm-hmm. fuck you. I can say whatever I want. I can do whatever I want. Right. And and the day and he will has never... spent 111 days out of this past year on vacation yes. at his private properties. His daughter has worn her branded labeled clothes on uh, most of her social media posts as a White House official. And she is opening a new boutique mm-hmm. uh, of her clothes at Trump Soho uh, this year. You know, this coming year, uh, not putting her business in a blind trust, no. not, you know, no. no, it's just like you said, it's fuck you, fuck ethics. Uh, the grifting is right out in the open yeah. and uh, try and stop me. And the fact that he was elected without releasing his tax return and the media didn't put a stop to it immediately and say, look, we're not going to treat him as a serious candidate. We're not going to interview him because no. he's a flake. Because he won't release his tax returns, we cannot take take him seriously. Uh, they did have the power to be that kind of gatekeeper. They sure did, and they um, instead opted for the Donald Trump empty podium show. Empty podium show, exactly, yep. exactly. And they all have to burn. So uh, in the lie category, again, I don't I don't believe I'll ever live to see the day when people in the White House press corps say, uh, "Sarah, your boss lies all the time," mm-hmm. and here's a bunch of lies he told today. What's he going to lie about tomorrow? Mm-hmm. Um, how is he going to lie his way out of this? And just take it as a fact that, of course, your boss is a liar. And, of course, you are lying to us now. So my question and, – and proceed every question with that statement yep. right across the board. Everyone in the press room says, well, of course you're lying. You, you lie every day to us. You come out here and embarrass yourself and humiliate us and, and embarrass your profession and shit all over journalism. So we're just wondering what are you going to lie about, us, what are you gonna lie about today? Uh, but they don't want to do that because they would – that chair would be empty tomorrow. And right. that's a shame. So, for example, uh, President Stupid claimed that he'd signed more legislation than any president at this point in his term. Uh, actually, that's the opposite of truth. <laughs> uh, he signed fewer bills into law than any president dating back to at least Eisenhower. Mm-hmm. Uh, but this is why it works. Um, 44% of Republicans believe that Donald Trump has repealed the Affordable Care Act. And if we, if Donald Trump says that he's built the wall and shows a picture of a wall, yeah. they'll believe that he built the wall. Too. I mean, really, yeah. this, they're, they're trained seals, and they will not believe. You could haul their ass down to, down to the Tex-Mex border and walk them down it, and they still wouldn't believe you. And that's just terrifying. I mean, it's it's hilarious when small groups of people uh, who are out of their minds amuse you or put on little shows or or act weird. It's kind of creepy and whatnot. But when when you gather sixty million of them together on purpose under one roof to act as a battering ram to destroy this country, it stopped being funny about twenty five years ago. Right. And it's I'm delighted that the never Trumpers are finally noticing uh, that they've done this. And I would very much like to have them on this podcast and ask them <laughs> three or four pretty basic questions about where were you when the lights were out? <laughs> you know, yeah. what were you doing when your party was becoming a seditious pile of, of traitors and monsters? Right. Oh, I was making a shit ton of money off of it and blaming liberals because something something freedom. Mm-hmm. That's what I was doing. Um, the attacks on the FBI by the party of law enforcement and on Bob Mueller are now constant. It's yep. it's all day, every day. Um, and this is the part that, that, that we need to understand because Donald Trump is using the Republican Party base, which people like David Frum and David Brooks and Michael Gerson and all the rest of them built – for exactly mm-hmm. this purpose. That's the point. The Republican base isn't isn't being used for anything other than what it was intended to be. 
which is something to bulldoze uh, anything standing between Republicans and power, power. out of the way. Yeah, right. They're just freaked out that the, that the driver who's driving the battering ram is not the one they chose. Right. But he's using the Republican Party as it was intended to be, as a, as a big, blunt instrument to smash this country to the ground so that his friends can loot it. Mm -hmm. And that's all the Republican Party base was ever engineered to do. And nothing, no amount of tweaking of Jurassic Park Island monster DNA is going to change that. This is who they are until the day they die. Uh, the next generation is going to be different, hopefully. And all of the people of the outsiders and the people of color and the people who are coming to this country and women who have been sidelined are going to fill in the blanks these people leave behind as they mm -hmm. depart this veil of tears. And this country will be a better place in 20 years. But we don't yeah. live 20 years from now. We live right now. Right. Right. And and any highfalutin language about, mm -hmm. uh, you know, what America is right now, we don't have time for. No. no. <laughs> uh, and I had a very nice exchange with Joy Ann Reed today yes, about did. that. Tell so us about I'm that. I'm very grateful to her. Well, she she gave an interview last night. On, we're recording this on Thursday, uh, on the last word about and you know she had hosted for Rachel and then ran upstairs to be on with Ari Melber. Uh, I gotta say, for um, as much as we rag on MSNBC, uh, their primetime bench is pretty deep. Yeah, and when you can have Rachel Maddow replaced by Joanne Reed and. Lawrence O'Donnell replaced by Ari Melber. Yes. And then Joanne Reed run upstairs and be on the last word mm -hmm. and contribute as she does. You know, that's, you, I got to hand it to him. That's I'm a liking, pretty deep end. I'm like an Ali Belshi. I'm like an. Uh, oh, yeah. Ms. Everybody Ruler. loves Ali. And, and Stephanie Rule's personal hero of mine. Yeah. And they know so much. They, they are do. They are really, uh, yeah. They just, bring, just they bring shit to the party. They, yeah. they, they, and, and they've reported enough on economics mm -hmm. and the stock market and, and I, you learn from them every time they're yeah. on. That's the important thing. That's yes. what that's what television news is supposed to be I know, about. Cable's supposed, supposed to be about that. It's supposed to be that way. Uh, yeah. But Joanne Reed wanted to say something, be, and and I understand totally the context in which she was speaking. And I my post about this at Crooks and Liars was totally about. I love Joanne Reed. I you know she's an award winner to me, and I just think the world of her. Um, she, what she said uh, last night in, in response to um, Barack Obama being named one of the most admired men in the world and but via a poll and Donald Trump not being. Right. And she made this rather poetic point that uh, Barack Obama is what we want America to be and Donald Trump is what we fear America is. Right. And I I get where she was going with that. But at the same time, what she said was that Trumpism uh, is somehow inside of us. It lives in us all. Us. And it, and like you said, this war on pronouns that you have. Um... First of all, it's Republican. Yeah. Yeah. yeah it's, and, and she said two words that just had alarm bells going off in my head. Trumpism, which, you know, I have a war on Trumpism going on, and America. And it hurt me to see her pointing to herself. And I know she was just demonstrating the idea of America, right. but pointing to herself and saying, and Donald Trump is that part of us that is scared and suspicious of strangers. And, and, and my point in the post was, Joy Ann Reed, that's, that is not you at all. No. <laughs> you know, no. don't, don't take that on. Don't take on that. Uh, the bigotry and the, um, and the excuse making for Don, for this being Trumpism. Right. Uh, which may have been a slip or it may have, she may have been trying to say something bigger about, I think she was, I think she was trying to make a very large point about our psyche as a nation. And, yeah. and she did explain this to me on Twitter and I get it that you can't now, deny. Walk that, that back, um, Blue Gal. What? What? Walk that back. So, so Joanne Reed was chatting you up on Twitter. Oh, come on. <laughs> yes, she did. She, yes, she, yes. Just, she just, responded to the post because yes, it was addressed did. to her. Yes. And it's at Crooks and Liars. And so, mm -hmm. I mean, that that blog, I am honored to be a part of that blog, and it has the reputation that you pay attention to it. And so. you wrote it. And I wrote it. Yes, yes. I did. Okay. Just to be clear. Um, <laughs> my wife have, wrote that, just to be clear. John Amato is very good at uh, hiring people. I've said this before. He's very good at hiring people who do not have a byline ego. Okay. Right. Uh, that's why Crooks and Liars works is because we are there to get the good stories out, to figure out what's worth talking about and present it in a way that is uh, well-written and 
imp- and and s- sifting the chaff from the wheat. Okay. Sure. And je- but I don't work for Gian Amato, so I get to celebrate. <laughs> you're the fact married. That my to wife me. is awesome. Yeah. Who's a great artist and a great writer, and I'm damn <laughs> lucky you. to have her. Thank you. Hmm? Well, I'm damn lucky to have you too. Uh, so, but uh, she said uh, on Twitter in response to this this post, she said, you know, we can't deny that the country we live in and love started with st- slavery existing. Right. And so, yes, when you're talking about America in that idealized way, mm-hmm. to deny that and 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 you know we need to go up against this belief. Of, My country, right or wrong, wave the flag. There's nothing wrong with America, and yet you're making America great again, right? Right. right. Because. <laughs> Because that, so, you know, yeah. that black guy was president, he, he got everything dirty. He got everything dirty, right? So uh, for her to say, no, there are things in America, and we are all Americans, mm-hmm. that we need to acknowledge are a part of us. The history of slavery yes. is a part of oh, us. Absolutely. So yes, yes. acknowledge that. And I I get that. Mm-hmm. Uh, but, but the Trumpism part of it, uh, Donald Trump came down that escalator and repeated Fox News Republican orthodoxy about Mexicans, Muslims, and nasty women. Right. And... You cannot deny, and no one can deny, that uh, it's Republican orthodoxy, that it's Republicanism, not Trumpism, mm-hmm. and Trumpism, that word, is a lifeboat. Yes. And don't let anyone get away with, well, I never liked the tweets. Well, he wasn't really a Republican. Well, I'm an independent. That's right. <laughs> And you'll see that those excuses are coming fast now, folks. And, and our job... We'll see the end of this. And I know we have a lot of... Uh, a or lot see of, that this is not going to be remembered uh, in the history books as a, a great thing. No. Uh, and so they want to make sure that their little lifeboat, their little career, their little thing, uh, that they wind up on the right side, not the losing side, right? right? So I'm an independent. Okay. And, and, uh, and I know Don't that, let anyone get away with that. I know that we oh, on the and, left... and we met with someone. We want to say hi to Joe. Oh, yes, yes. Uh, one of our listeners, Joe, met with us and had coffee with us yesterday. And I love what he said about his family uh, getting to the point now where it's like, I don't pay attention to any of it. Yeah, I don't pay politics. <laughs> I don't pay attention to politics. It's just, it's all bad. It's all bad. <laughs> yeah. No, it's not all bad. It's no. all, you know, it, but, but this is the point. This is, this is very yeah. important. Uh, this, in addition to cleaning up on aisle one, two, three, four, five, six, mm-hmm. seven, eight, mm-hmm. you know, forever, mm-hmm. um, which is what liberals have to do after Republicans shit all over everything. One of the things we really, that I'm charging us to do mm-hmm. is to make both sides do it a shameful thing to say. Right. It, it should be a shameful thing to have that in your mouth. You should be a joke. Chuck Todd should wince and gag every time he has to say it because his job depends on it. Mm -hmm. If we can, there's a whole lot to do in 2018, but we we absolutely have to take that away from them. And I know it's really hard to do because we don't own the cameras. We, the microphones we have are donated and they're, and they're gratefully accepted. We don't have the kind of powerful platform individually, but collectively, if we bear down on this one thing until it cracks, it will crack. And, and it is cracking, and we're seeing it on Twitter. It's awesome to see. It really see is. It really is. More and more people saying, oh, come on. It's not Congress. It's the Republicans. Mm-hmm. And uh, on Twitter, you're not getting away with that. And I do think that that's the canary in the coal mine for that kind of uh, argument of, well, both sides. No, no, you don't get to say that. No. Everybody knows, as you put the song up. Everybody. Leonard Cohen. Thank God. Leonard Cohen. Everybody knows the fight Everybody. is fixed, and you're fixing it. Everybody knows that. Uh-huh. Yeah. Well, you want to talk about Anna Wintour for one second? <laughs> sure. This is this well, is sort of. Well, I don't really perfect... want to talk about Anna Wintour. I want to talk about knitting. Oh, okay. <laughs> Anna I want to talk about Vanity Fair. Yeah. Deciding that Hillary Clinton needs to take up a hobby Fuck and you, having their, their young, uh, you know, their millennial uh, editorial staff come on. And now, first of all, I do not understand whose idea this was. To all holding, this. each holding a glass of champagne, a glass of champers. Yeah. Yeah. I, it's New Year's. I, this, this make, it makes zero sense to me mm-hmm. because the argument of this video that Vanity Fair put out and I, I Clearly, you know, we talked about this many times at this time of year. Yes. The B team is in charge. Yep. Because everyone that is important and has actual responsibilities on vacation. Except us. And except us. Except us. We never, we we don't do that. Mm-hmm. So, uh, but, but the fact that uh, these millennial staffers got to put out a video with Vanity Fair's name on it. 
Uh huh. Um, telling Hillary Clinton to get a hobby um, when she's already announced that she's never running again for anything. Right. And and the point of this was don't run again. That the underlying argument to Hillary Clinton about this was instead of running for president again, take up knitting. Yeah. Um, it was sexist. It was demeaning. It was stupid. Right. And it wasn't based on any uh, news story or announcement or anything that had anything to do with anything. It, no, it, it was, was it was a bunch of snarky kids uh, on camera with TP, booze. TPing a house. Exactly. Yeah. Exactly. On film. And pissing off the women's mm -hmm. pussy hat movement. Yeah. A core part of which was hand knitting hats as a symbolic way to take back a dirty word Donald Trump said about women. Mm -hmm. Well, you know, see, and you know who else would disagree with that, little gal? I don't know. Glenn Greenwald. Oh, God. Because, uh, because Glenn Greenwald has it in his power to declare <laughs> who the... Who the resistance heroes are? Yeah, yeah. Uh, they're yeah. not. There are no women involved at uh -huh. all. The resistance. Uh -huh. There are no Democratic women. There are no That's women of special. color. There's no. Yeah. There are no liberal men. There's no. But no. The the resistance heroes are all Bush forty three people. Mm -hmm. uh, and because uh, Glenn Greenwald needs to say that because Glenn Greenwald is a giant prolapsed anus and has to say <laughs> shit like this to make his moron followers happy. So everyone in the resistance is now complicit because they all made uh, Mueller and Frum and Hayden and Comey heroes. These are mm -hmm. all hero heroes of the resistance. And as Glenn Greenwald himself said, it's not accurate to say that in 2017, Bill Kristol became a Democrat. It's more accurate to say that in 2017, Democrats became Bill Kristol. Well, and I loved your commenter who said uh, Glenn Greenwald became Tucker Carlson. Yeah, he did. Well, that's his job now. He, he is now Tucker Carlson's sidekick. <laughs> Yes. Uh, when Jill Stein is not in town. <laughs> um, but moving back to our list, I just sort of threw that in there, a, a little spin at the end there. Uh, it made Donald, me laugh. I'm sorry, but you have the best laugh in town. Oh, no, but, well, well, and and I just just getting back to the Anna Winter. Vanity Fair, yes. Vanity Fair. So Vanity Fair dissed knitters. Right. Uh, for no reason at all, dissed Hillary Clinton. Uh -huh. uh, and uh, really stepped in it, and Twitter took over. And had, you know, cancel Vanity Fair. And they issued an apology. Mm -hmm. um, and so then this morning to distract himself and everybody else from his golfing. I, I got to assume I, I, I should have checked. I, I got to assume that Fox and Friends had something on about this because mm -hmm. why else would Donald Trump say anything about it? Uh, Donald Trump decides that he's going to go after Anna Wintour. Yes. Who, who begged. Uh, who begged. To be, uh, ambassador. to be ambassador to England, and, right, and, to the court of St. James. And right. fundraised for loser crooked Hillary. Mm -hmm. And now she's apologizing because, man, she fucked up, didn't she? she? But except that she's not editor of Vanity Fair yeah. magazine. Oh, um, and Donald Trump didn't go after the men that own Condé Nast, which does publish Vogue magazine, where Anna Wintour is an editor, yes. and Vanity Fair. And by the way... Yes. Um, I have no sympathy for Anna Wintour. No, I think no. she's a terrible person. Right, all the way through. But the fact that President <laughs> Stupid couldn't yeah. figure out, you know, fuck it, they're both V's. I mean, how hard can that be? You know, <laughs> the fact that he narrowed it down to the letter V, I think, shows great forward progress. Well, and he doesn't like Anna Wintour anyway because she uh, disinvited Donald Trump from the Met Gala. Apparently, she runs the Met Gala also, mm -hmm. uh, and, you know, which is a fashion show. Mm -hmm. uh, on the red carpet and she told uh you know some late night show donald trump's never invited to that again uh apparently donald trump asked melania to marry him at the met gala so oh. this is all very very personal mm -hmm. uh and it was an opportunity for him to be petty yeah be petty and slam anna wintour and be petty and though... wrong that's the part that's hilarious be petty and yeah, wrong. and then he did it wrong just yeah. fucked up he just tripped over his own dick mm -hmm. and and somehow this will not be you know it'll be forgotten by next week but anna wintour now goes on the list with haitians all of whom have aids yes and right. nigerians who can't stay here because if we let them in, they'll never, quote unquote, go back to their huts in Africa. Which I'm is, so sick of having this racist asshole as our president. I, it's Can just, I just say that? Yeah, I'm so sick of having racist assholes in this country who think he's right? a great job. Yeah, right, um, right. Now, uh, why is Donald Trump packing the courts? Well, two stories, <laughs> back to back. 
The first was a federal judge told Donald Trump that uh, his his fucking fake voter fraud commission actually has to hand over their records to the Democrats, who they would not include in their deliberations and yeah. excluded from everything else. Sorry. Well, they, they were able to do it at the FCC, so why not? Yeah. yeah. And a federal appeals court also rejected his bid to block military from accepting transgender recruits starting on January 1st. So the courts are doing what courts are supposed to do, and that makes the petty lunatic racist in the White House very angry. Mm -hmm. So he's trying to pack the courts with as many uh, uh, Republican assholes as he possibly can before he's dragged off in uh, in an orange jumpsuit. Uh, and and uh, speaking of just waving his dick in his base's face, after having said a billion times that this tax thing's bad for me, it's bad. It's going to be bad mm-hmm. for me. Is my friends? My friends all hate me. They all hate me. Nobody talks to me anymore because you know I just have this horror. It's all going to be great for you guys, but I'm going to personally suffer from it. So what does he do? He goes swaggering around his his shitty resort, telling all of his rich friends that you all got a lot richer. Hours after he signed this bill that plunders the future to pay Mm -hmm. for his rich friends, uh, to make them incrementally more wealthy and to make sure that this gets sold to the morons and they don't rise up and and rebel. The Koch brothers are going to launch a multi-million dollar multimedia campaign next year to sell the the hell out of this thing. Uh, in the heartland where you and I live. So I assume we're going to be seeing a lot of commercials about that. Well, and this is the thing that I keep thinking about with Roy Moore, Mm -hmm. that this is very much related to that. Roy Moore, Republican women in Alabama, a lot of them stayed home. Mm -hmm. And uh, Junior Dude, by the way, found an article uh, about the write-in votes in Alabama. People wrote in Jesus Christ. Yeah. People wrote in the Lord. And it was, you know, the sense of betrayal that somehow uh, for that group of people, um, these these pedophilia Mm -hmm. uh, stories were offensive. And we're a problem. And the number of Republican women that stayed home, I think, is related to how universal uh, the Me Too movement is. How how every woman has been in an elevator where they felt uncomfortable or on public transportation where they felt uncomfortable Uh or an office where they felt uncomfortable or a marriage where they felt uncomfortable. And that universal feeling of of true victimhood, of really feeling uncomfortable in your own uh, ownership of your body, uh, caused people to to break the zeitgeist that was continuing to run by their house over and over again. Yep. Right. Yep. And that's going to have that is happening also just in general politics. That the the one thing you can actually say as a can as a Democratic candidate is the Koch brothers are investing against me. Yes. And uh, that. Shame, that does shame boots on the ground Republicans who really, really do want the swamp drained. There is a sense uh, in middle America among very conservative voters that my vote doesn't mean anything because of money. Mm-hmm. And they blame both sides and they do a lot of stupid things that you and I try to call out. Mm-hmm. But they genuinely feel as though Washington is not listening to them. Because of fat cats. Yeah. And this tax bill is the perfect, perfect example to run against. Mm-hmm. And I'm so proud of the large number of Democrats that are running. The 50-state strategy finally is coming into being. Yes. Finally. finally. Let us learn this lesson, folks. Let us mm-hmm. learn it. You run everywhere. Uh, challenge all the time everywhere. Challenge mm-hmm. all the time. And and run against Trump. Right. Uh, we we know that uh, our the The governor, um, the candidate for governor in Illinois, J.B. Pritzker, who Mm -hmm. I wish we didn't have to have a billionaire running for governor on the Democratic side. I really, really wish we didn't have to do that. Yes, yes, Uh, yes I do. But we have a a guy who is governor of Illinois who is a hedge fund billionaire uh, who bought the Republican Party, who paid for the reelection of every single state senator in the state house. Mm -hmm. Republican uh, personally financed it. So he owns that. He owns all of those Republicans. Now, they're in the minority, but he owns all of them. Mm-hmm. And, uh, you know, there, there's nothing to stop him from doing that. No. And that's wrong. And every so, J.B. Prisker commercial begins with Donald Trump is unfit to be president. Exactly. Every J.B. But that is the thing. And and mm-hmm. also, and this is true about J.B. Pritzker, mm-hmm. the fact that he has been uh, on the on the uh, protest lines yeah. with gay rights groups, with women's groups, with 
the union groups, um, and he and he has paid attention to downstate as well. So yes, yes he has. He's he has done the right things for a long time, and has put his money into making Illinois better for a long time, particularly mm-hmm. Chicago. Um, so that is not a small thing. So you know, and and because he's so rich, he's turning out to be the only game in town. Yeah. Um, I I don't know if you noticed that one of my Twitter heroes, Andy Slavitt, yes, uh, endorsed um, Renard Renardio. What is his name? The um, guy who's running for attorney general. In, oh man, you're gonna Illinois? you're gonna pop quiz. No, me I don't on mean this? to do that. Mariotti. I don't mean to do that. Mariotti. Thank uh-huh. you. Mm-hmm. Uh, endorsed him for attorney general of yeah. Illinois, which was enough for me. Yeah. Um, and I, you know, you don't like to just say, oh, well, if he's being endorsed by that guy. But I do trust Andy Slavitt. Well, you know, this is the right guy. Just a, a little bit of um, history. Once upon mm-hmm. a time, a million years ago, I was on that a tiny group of people that would vet candidates. Right. For precisely right. that reason, I vetted a congressman named Barack Obama who got yes, you did. creamed in that election, got creamed in that election. <laughs> uh, but I still have my I still have my Barack the vote ticket to the fundraiser uh, that mm-hmm. says on the bottom in very small print, corporate donations are not accepted, which I think is hilarious. <laughs> uh, but there, because down ticket um, races are so um, unknown by a lot of right, people, right. it is helpful to have a group of people who are liberal, progressive, thoughtful people who vet right. candidates. And and we right. used to stuff, you know, 50,000, 100,000 little uh, voting lists into all the papers. And uh, people would depend on them, not for governor, not for president or senator, but for water reclamation district, right, for right. aldermen. That no, shit that's was, important. That should make right. a huge difference because those yep. those are elections that are decided by a few hundred votes either way. And right. that's your right. bench. That's the bench you're building for the next year and the next and the next and the next. Exactly. So it really exactly. does matter. So it really does matter. And and we actually met someone at Netroots Nation a couple of years ago who was running for water reclamation in yes. Chicago. Yeah. Like, and I thought, oh, my gosh, really? And, yeah, she was handing out cards, yeah. and she was uh, saying, no, this is really what I want to do, and here's what I want. Here's my platform and what I want to do about it. And I realized, wow, she is not looking for my vote because I'm not going to vote for no. Chicago Water Reclamation District. She's looking for me if someone in Chicago asks me, "Yes, do I know this person? I can say, yeah. Matters. I, really- I met her in an elevator at Netroots Nation, and she seemed like she knew what she was talking about. Yeah. You're listening to the Professional Left Podcast, ProLeftPod.com. Uh, we are recording on Friday now. Yes. And uh, wanted to say a few things about uh, Donald Trump's certifiably crazy interview. Yes. Uh, it was at Mar-a-Lago. Apparently, the reporter from the New York Times was introduced to Trump by the CEO of Newsmax, who happened to be at Mar-a-Lago uh, at the golf club. And, in case you uh, don't know who Newsmax is, they're the ones who basically uh, were in charge of peddling the Vince Foster was assassinated ooh, crap. Oh, yeah. And their their Twitter stream is just a hoot. <laughs> it's, just, it's, it's an open sewer. They're yeah. a fucking open sewer. Yeah. Yeah. So that was and, broken And well-funded open sewer with, mm-hmm. you know, lots of equipment and, and video and audio technology at their disposal. And... A and bottomless he was on. pit of money. Yeah, he was being interviewed on MSNBC right. today, and and the never CEO, once did... the CEO of Newsmax. Yes. yes. Yeah. On on liberal TV, and mm-hmm. never once did anyone ask him about you know Vince Foster being murdered. Right. Right. Because that would be rude, no, I guess. I guess so. Yeah. yeah. So uh, so that happened. The the access to Donald Trump without any uh, White House staff knowing about it or having any way of prepping him for an interview or. Uh, filtering this through any kind of, you know, responsible party. Just sit down. Do you mind if I record this? No, go ahead. And I'm going to tell you how I feel about taking over the Justice Department, telling them what to do, whatever. And I'll tell them to do whatever. And, uh, you know, it's it's all about the election results, which were phenomenal. <laughs> yeah. You know, he's just well, crazy. I mean, uh, well, I, I think yeah. it's worse than that. I think mm-hmm. he's really, really showing signs of, of uh, outright dementia. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, like really dangerously mm-hmm. undetached from reality, can't figure out where he is, mm-hmm. falls back on just, you know, catchphrases that he's memorized yeah. Yeah. To, to get him from one paragraph to the next. Because he has and no saying no idea collusion what he's about. 16 times in yeah. one paragraph. Yeah. 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 It's it, it's not um, crazy like a fox anymore. It's he's he's mentally ill and everyone around him knows it, knows it and is enabling it and allowing it. Sure. Right. He's still useful. He's still a useful idiot. 
Well, and and John Harwood is not somebody who uh, steps out of a script or right. steps out of the professional newsman script yeah. to start uh, – expressing strong opinions about things or to say I'm, you know, this is off the reservation. And last night he said, uh, this is delusion. (laughs) This is not ordinary, you know, run of the mill. I disagree with him or uh, he's, he's, he's a little off or he's must've been tired. This is no, this is delusional. And as you say, I, there are, there are three parties in all of this, right? One Uh is Trump himself, right? Uh, in his own world, believes the presidency is a reality show, right. uh, doesn't see any reason to uh, take any responsibility for anything that's going wrong, and nope. over over emphasizes that anything that went right must be because of him. Or personally. Then you have the enabling structures around him, his family, mm-hmm. the White House staff, the mm-hmm. RNC, the Republican Congress, et cetera, mm-hmm. all enabling this. And right. Fox News, exactly. Part that. That state TV is absolutely part of the problem. Yes. Uh, and then you have the media. And and I don't include Fox News in that because they are no. clearly part of the propaganda machine propping up Donald Trump. They aren't actual right. media. And a number of people on Twitter this morning really gave it to the New York Times and, the, and this particular reporter about, you know, why didn't you push back on anything he said? Mm-hmm. And it seems to me that the, um, you know, I don't know how to put it I, I often say the northeast corridor media rather than the beltway yeah. media because it's let's New say York the and it's let's say the acela corridor media. the, the mm-hmm. acela corridor media yes doesn't take this president seriously and looks at it as a career opportunity rather than as a job yeah. for uh that you have a responsibility as the fourth estate to hold up democracy you know that right. that's your goal. That's that's your role in life. It's more no. What could, what will this do for my career? And uh, they're falling down on the job. And I know the New York Times is circling the wagons this morning, but they don't have any credibility in terms of the kind of people that they get to do this kind of job over right. and over again. And well, it's careerism rather than a, res- a a service, a public service. We don't they, seem they to have ask- anyone in this whole environment that cares about what is happening with democracy. The, then you ask the question, mm-hmm. which since we're recording this over the course of two days, yeah. I think I might have asked 12 hours ago. <laughs> Wouldn't surprise me. <clears throat> is But what is their job? Yeah, yeah. Uh, if their job is to be a journalist, then they're they have been failing at that job for for a long mm-hmm. time, for decades. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. But really and truly, I, I just on when I was skipping past the, the Morning Joe today, uh, I saw whatever his name, Victor Von Hair Product. I don't know what it is. His hair has is over three feet tall. <laughs> it has its own. It has its own postal code. Yeah. Go postal unions, by the way. Yeah. Uh, and he was just imploring the people to get out of the the bubble and go talk to people in middle America around a table full of people who haven't touched a real person from middle America in 20 fucking years. Well, and the person that we call that son of a bitch, (laughs) one of our donors who you, you love, we we love him dearly. Bill, Mm -hmm. um, Bill texted me this morning and said, I'm, I'm apparently supposed to go and talk to someone I've blocked on Twitter. Yes. Which means I, and I'm going to quote him. He said, which means um, I'll be going back to the Klan meetings, just not all of them. Right. <laughs> right. I mean, right. at one if point, I may quote... when you when you block someone because they physically threatened you, or they're spouting Pizzagate nonsense. I mean, there are certain yeah. words that I just block automatically um, because I I just don't want that in my timeline at all. Mm-hmm. And Pizzagate is one of them. Just yeah. no. If you're mentioning Pizzagate, I don't want you in my timeline. So I don't have those tweets in my timeline, period. If I may quote the inimitable Tom Lehrer mm-hmm. from a, a two generations ago and his tuneful melody, National Brotherhood Week. Yes, right. right. Step up and take the hand of someone you just can't stand. Uh-huh. Uh huh. Yeah, because that'll solve everything. Yeah. The reason that, that we block people like that, that – that we have written off, I personally have written off just whole swaths of the population, is not because I'm doing it whimsically or because I like doing it. It's it's like the Iraq War. Nobody nobody on the left wanted to be right about the Iraq War. We were terrified that we were right about the Iraq War, and it turned out we were. 
Nobody on the left wants to believe that the Republican Party really is just absolutely a shit pile of crazy racist morons and gun nuts and theocrats and homophobes and so on and so forth. But it is. It is a self-reinforcing shit pile. And so after decades of attempting to reach out to them, most of us have finally said, no, 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 we've tried. You assholes in the Acela Corridor, the only time you even brush up against a working class person is on your way between here and there. You have, I mean, as I said yesterday or an hour ago, whichever it is, David Brooks spent, you know, two weeks just tearing his, you know, rending his garments going, I have to get out of the university in the bubble and go talk to people who work for a living, which he didn't do. Yes, right. Because it's boring. Right. Because that's not his job. That's not any of their job. Their job is to tell each other and to tell the people who run their network fairy tales about who the Republicans really are and why really it is both sides who are being cruel and misunderstanding and unforgiving. And if only everyone would just reach out across the aisle, everything would work out great, which is bullshit, which is just errant bullshit. But that is the fairy tale that people who are cowards, who live in the middle, and who, and especially cowards who live in the middle, who live in the Acela Corridor, who it doesn't matter what Donald Trump does, unless he starts lobbing nukes around, nothing he does will affect their lives in the slightest. They will still have a, a massively overpaid lifestyle. They will still uh, associate with people who agree with them. They will never have to go into the you know dark interior of America and mm -hmm. look around at what's really going on out there. They're immune to all this shit. So it's very easy for them to sort of ladle out advice about how everyone else should live their lives because they have no idea what the hell the rest of the country does with their lives. We do, <laughs> and yeah. we would be happy to tell them, but we tell them a story they do not want to hear. And since they own the microphones and the cameras, they're never going to hear it. Hey, uh, Drift Glass, we also want to do a prop to the postal unions, a separate prop. A separate prop. Separate because big ups. Donald Trump got up this morning, got off the crapper and watched some Fox and Friends and found out about Amazon being a bad thing because they get cheap postal rates. And isn't damn that it. unfair? God damn it. I don't know where I know where that came from. It came out of somebody's butt because they don't want to talk about Trump Russia. They don't want to talk mm -hmm. about last night's New York Times interview. No. So they're going to talk about anything else. And Donald Trump sees an opportunity again mm -hmm. to get back at one of his perceived enemies. This is just another, you know, now we've forgotten all about Vanity Fair and <laughs> going up against the wrong editor. Of Vanity, Vanity who? Fair. What? V yeah. something? V for victory? Now it's v for vendetta? Jeff Bezos in the Washington Post by going after Amazon. Yeah. And so their stock ticked down just a little bit this morning because Donald Trump said, Amazon gets this cheap postal service is losing all this money and it's just terrible and sends this stupid tweet out. I before, there is, a, there is a distraction box at Fox and Friends. Mm -hmm. A box full of just crazy ass um, yep. uh, tangential nonsense mm -hmm. stories that, that are can just pretty, pull out, right? They just pull out one, you know, when whenever Donald Trump needs to be distracted or mm -hmm. all their mm -hmm. all their meathead viewers need to be distracted from the scary thing that's happening today in the real world, they pull out some bullshit story about Millennials Christmas cards are ruining or millennials. New Year's Eve. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> Ornaments that are, you know, oh my. And, and the, then this whole herd of livestock just follow them right and, off. And the number one story on foxnews.com this morning, yeah. Huma Abedin's cousin. First That's, cousin. Yeah, first first cousin. cousin going to jail. And uh, apparently used a fake email to try to defend himself. So email goes in the title. Right. Abedin and email. Huma, oh. Huma Abedin email goes in the oh. title. And they put that up as the number one trending story in the U.S. Going on their big, website. Honey. <laughs> well, it was according to Rasmussen. It's a number one. You know, and it, then it, because because it's just this circle jerk, right? And then uh, I went back because I had I wrote about it, and the the comment thread at this article wanted Trey Gowdy to be Attorney General. So, so. Sure. got the look. He's hey, look. there you go. We're going to move on and just say uh, Happy New Year, everybody. We love you guys. Yeah. Hey, each week we post to our Facebook page and website an Internet Kitty sent in by you, the listeners. This week's Internet Kitty is Midnight. Midnight is a beautiful black kitty, just like the black kitties we have here living here at Casa DGBG. Uh, he's got a little white on his uh, under his chin, uh, but he's a beautiful kitty. You should go visit him at our Facebook page and website. You can send your internet kitty to us at our email address, proleftpodcast at gmail.com, where you can also write to both of us. I want to remind everybody, if you're trying to reach us with some 
hints or tips or good stuff, because we love the good stuff you send and all the we tips, do. We do. Uh, you can uh, write to both of us with one email address. It forwards to both of our email boxes at proleftpodcast at gmail.com. Feel free to write us. We love hearing from you. Be aware, if you write us at any of our addresses, we reserve the right to read your email or U.S. Postal Service. Go Postal Unions! Letter on the air, unless you say otherwise. Don't forget our gourmet coffee guideline. If you can afford to buy an espresso-based beverage for yourself, buy one for us. This is not charity. This is our job. And now here's a word from Wilfred Brimley. How you going? I'm former Hollywood old guy and film megastar Wilfred Brimley. I was the granddad at Cocoon that said, We'll never get old and we'll never ever die. Well, I'm dead. Who saw that coming? But even though I'm dead, I donate regularly to the Professional Left Podcast at ProLeftPod.com. That drift glass gets madder than I was in the China Syndrome. And Blue Gal can snap my old suspenders anytime. <laughs> and even though the aliens taught us that all financial transactions are relics of a primitive social order unrelated to the eternal cosmic continuum, money comes in mighty handy when you're battling the forces of evil and trying to raise a family. Now, I know you listen to them, so what say you go over to ProLeftPod.com and help them bring you the show every week. That's ProLeftPod.com. Heck, I'm dead, and I do it. You can, too. This is your grandpa saying, get off your backside and give him a donation. ProLeftPod.com. Well, I gotta go. I uh, got a tennis game with Elvis at two. Where are my pants? So thank you to uh, Bill from the Bill Show for that. Yeah. Another another yeah. great ad from Bill. We appreciate that so much. And uh, it's now time to announce the last winner of our beautiful bracelet cuff from foxwise.biz. I understand these are going to be arriving here on Tuesday, the mm-hmm. um, 2nd of January. So, so I have to wait until next year. I'm yeah, sorry, but that's year, just the gonna, way it goes. They're going to get out to you. No problem. Um Check out our website to see how great these bracelets look. The one we are giving away says resist and has snowflakes on either side along with our URL. If you want to buy something from foxwise.biz, don't forget to use the coupon code DGBG2017 for 20% off anything, including custom orders. Foxwise.biz. We are running this contest as a way of saying thank you to our donors. Our winner this week, the last winner, is Wendy in Kansas. Uh, love you, Wendy, and we'll be sending you this next week. It's a cuff bracelet along with a $10 gift card to Donors Choose that you can donate to a school in your area or a classroom that is looking for help in an area you support. Approximately, and I want to say approximately, we've gone over our records for the end of the year. It really is almost exactly 1% of our listeners support this podcast with a contribution. Mm-hmm. And you can too. See our website, proleftpod.com, for details. Both our PayPal postal address information, any way that you can donate to us, it's all there. It's all there. It's all there, including T-shirts and bumper stickers from Zazzle and our Patreon account. All of it is there, proleftpod.com. Please share our show on Facebook or Twitter, and thank you for doing that. I especially want to give a a little promotion to the Both Sides Don't T-shirt and bumper sticker. We're really trying to... I'm getting a mess of those. Yeah, and we're trying to push that this year. That is the message for this year, as we mentioned earlier on the show. I would suggest business cards. That say both sides don't? It's just, you know, during the conversation, (laughs) the minute someone does that, you just reach into your pocket. Oh, no, did you realize? Both sides don't. And the flip side is a a little, is is our URL, ProLeftPod. You know, Mm -hmm. so that you can get more of the message if you need it, which you obviously do because you said it. Yeah. Here, asshole. Here. Here, read it. (laughs) Hey, now that's a way to connect with people, isn't really, it? Really, you're reaching out to others, <laughs> and I think that's so important. And that's the important so important. Thing. <laughs> it's so important. Really. I love you, Drift Glass. I love you too. Would you like and to close that with some New science Year? fiction? 
Happy New I'd Year. Like, I'd like to say, ask you one question first. Of course. How are the Internet Kitties doing this week? Oh, Blue Gal. The Internet Kitties note that it's it's for real cold here, like for real, real cold here. Mm-hmm. And they are so grateful to have a new furnace to keep them toasty and warm. And they want to wish each and every one of you a happy and peaceful New Year. So catch some rest and make some merry because 2018 is coming and we are coming out of the gates swinging. Let's think about living. Think about living. Let's think about loving. Think about the hooping and the hopping and the popping and the loving, lovey dovey. Let's forget about the whining and the crying and the shooting and the dying and the flower and the switchblade knife. Let's think about living. Let's think about life. The Professional Left Podcast is recorded under a Creative Commons license. Copyright 2017 Drift Glass Blue Gal Podcast. Minecraft is awesome. Now it's time for Science Fiction University with our science fiction expert, Jeff Glass. Science Fiction University, everybody. Yes, that's uh, Again, spoiler, spoiler, spoiler. Yes. We are here to talk about uh, the latest Star Wars offering, correct? The Last, the last Jedi. Yes, I'm here to talk about The Last Jedi. And you're going to have some spoilers in there. Probably. And, and I'm, gonna, I'm here to bring balance to the force. <laughs> All right. Uh, well, first of all, uh, this is Science Fiction University. We are not normalizing Trump by doing this. No, no, not uh, at all. We are taking just a mental break from Trump, which we all need. Mm-hmm. And uh, I want to just first of all ask you, is Star Wars science fiction? Well, there you've gone and ruined the ending of Science Fiction <laughs> University, Blue Gal. Um, the way you bring balance to the force is, is to remind ourselves, what is the simplest and most um, inclusive definition of science fiction? And the de- definition is, that you have always given me, if you yes. don't mind me saying it, and maybe Please I'm going to get this wrong, but let's Please. see. Science fiction, you can tell that something is science fiction if if you take the science out of the story, the story falls apart. That is, that is a broadly correct definition. Mm-hmm. Uh, absolutely. Now, there are exceptions to that. Um, there's psychological science fiction that doesn't, isn't quite that time travel and alternate history. There's no such thing as time travel. The alternate history is unprovable and probably not true or not available to us. But the idea is there's some scientific thing that's happening in the story that drives the plot. So is Star Wars science fiction? No, it is not. Star Wars is fantasy. Star Wars is a fantasy and fantasy has its own rules. Anybody who likes Game of Thrones, I like Game of Thrones quite a lot knows there are rules that you 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 establish that give shape to your universe. Uh, it, it is unfair and really shitty writing to say anybody can do anything anytime because fuck you magic. Mm-hmm. Uh, it is absolutely unsatisfying as a reader to have an indestructible protagonist, for example. There's no drama to that at all. Or to have, it, uh, to have magic that's just make it up as you go along magic. So good writers in both fantasy and science fiction establish a set of rules to go along with their universe and they don't violate them or if they do there's usually horrifying consequences so um star wars is, has never been science fiction it has it, it you can substitute anything you like for anything else you can substitute it's about it's washbuckling princes and princesses a mysterious religion with samurai swords made of lasers that's mm-hmm. the story you know it's the hero's journey and that's fine and you can enjoy it at that level and I have listened to the. I, I took the the lads uh, to go see the movie, aka the Autism Society. The Autism Society that, <laughs> that uh, still reconvenes in our basement. It does. When Junior Dude is in town, uh, he and his buds get together and they they play everything from Scrabble to to uh, Halo and uh, and enjoy each other's company immensely. And and it was the movie got released, so I took everybody to go see it. They were pretty cool with it. They kind of liked it. It was fun. They enjoyed it. But the criticism has fallen into two camps, one of which is, I love this movie. It's so awesome. Oh, you don't understand it. You're a fool. And this is a fucking mess, man. This is just <laughs> shitty, lazy writing um, because it, it's magic and anything can happen. So we're going to give um, – we're just and, – and that's the problem because it's not science fiction. It's it's – as far as I can tell, it's a series of like emotional tone poems designed to make you feel a certain way during each scene. And it mm-hmm. does that. It just doesn't have a story to it. There's no plot involved because there's no character development. There's no consequences. There's no arc. Uh, people die. People come. People go. Um, but there's there's stuff that you've clearly and well established in previous stories as a rule that that is just tossed away uh, and just cavalierly tossed away, not as part of a plot. Just I don't want to do that anymore. I want to make the force magic. Mm-hmm. And now you can do all this new shit with the force 
And I don't want to have to obey the laws of gravity or causality. Um, I want to be able to, to, to destroy a ship by jumping light speed into the middle of it, which is very cool, which, beggar, which begs the question, why didn't you do this before? Yeah. Um, yeah. You've had whole fl- – how does this terrible empire keep coming – you keep destroying this empire completely or, or damn near, and yet it keeps coming back. How does that keep happening? But that's for people who understand or, or see this movie as a story with a beginning and a middle and an end and um, pl- a plot <laughs> that drives it along. And Well, and, and it conflict. does from one movie to another. I mean I know they're going outside of yeah. some of the – some of the uh, earlier movies and doing prequels and so forth. But yeah. it all is supposed to follow some sort of timeline. It started with chapter four, right? I mean, right. that was the point of sort of starting in the middle. And then they had the disastrous one through three movies and so forth. Right. But it is there is supposed to be a timeline to this, right? Sure. There, well, there's yeah. it, there's supposed to be a, a, a story. <laughs> and and it, it's okay that you change the story. It's perfectly fine. You can change the story in the middle. You can shift your protagonist around. You can kill off. You know, this is this is what George R. R. Martin does. You know, he mm-hmm. poor Sean Bean. Yeah, <laughs> you know? right. Whoa, but but that's part of the story. The story yeah. is, oh, heroes die, mm-hmm. and then you're left with the common folk to deal with all of these complicated problems and 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 eons long uh, conflicts. In this, it's just it's like. They just had a grab bag of stuff they wanted to do and just did all of it. Hmm. Oh, here's a cool thing. Let's make it so the force means you can contact each other uh, halfway across the galaxy. Okay. And then you can you can project your body so far in, into – into uh, you can project your body while you're still in it. You're not dead yet. You can project your body halfway across the galaxy to the point where you actually fool people into thinking you're really there. Okay, let's do that. And you can use the force to survive – hard vacuum and massive explosions. Okay, let's do that. And wow. let's have force ghosts, uh, but they they have power in the universe. Uh, force ghosts can come back, but they can bring down lightning like Thor and destroy things. Sure, let's do that. And let's have a chase scene where it makes absolutely no sense at all why any of this works. Mm-hmm. Why, you know, one, it, it is it is the low-speed Bronco chase in space. <laughs> it's, we, it's we're traveling just fast enough where you can't catch us but you're almost catching us but you're getting ahead of us and you can't light speed out ahead and come back you can't call in the rest of your fucking fleet it's just dumb but that's if you understand it as a story where things make sense and if you have genetically engineered dinosaurs on page 10 rampaging and having certain characteristics by page 100 those dinosaurs don't suddenly sprout wings and start singing the Hallelujah Chorus right. and live in a different universe. This movie just doesn't give a shit about that. Mm-hmm. And mm-hmm. It, it really – and I understand that the point, the object of the exercise was to destroy the past. Let's just – and they say it over and over again. The, 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 we need to burn the past down, destroy the past, get rid of the past, move on to some new thing, which is great. You should do that. Except that you are literally taking every trope – from every previous movie and jumbling it together so that people go, oh, that looks like a Death Star. Oh, that looks like a – and and you're not doing new things. Mm-hmm. You're just doing old things exactly the same way you did them 20 years ago because that's what fans want to see. Mm-hmm. I, I don't have any objection to it, but I think it, it's not a movie in any conventional sense in the sense that it's a story. It's a movie in, in the sense that – is a series of very pretty pictures that depict completely unconnected scenes mm-hmm. that make you feel a certain way. So yeah. you're, you're you're going to an art museum and there's a very pretty picture of you know of of haystacks and there's a pretty picture of Starry Night and over here there's uh, a, a blue guitar player by Picasso. They're all lovely. They have nothing to do with each other, uh, but they're arranged in, in an order that makes you feel a certain way. And people want to go it, to go on. It, it's like going on. It literally, is like going on uh, to an amusement park. Mm-hmm. There's, no, there's no arc to. Uh, literally, there is, but there's no arc to a roller coaster. It just goes around and around. You feel a certain way, and you get off, and you throw up, or you feel great. <laughs> but it's <doesn't laughs> a story to it. it just, it's a ride you get on, and you go, and you go, woo, and you get off of it. You're not, you're not ennobled by it. it you're not, you don't learn anything from it. Um, it doesn't. <laughs> It, it, but it makes you feel a certain way, exhilarated or whatever it is you would feel. That's what this is. This is a this is a a a uh, an amusement a series of amusement park rides that internally don't make any sense at all. Um, violate a whole bunch of 
really, really basic rules of writing. Um, don't you know they have characters doing shit for no reason, just literally wasting time for 20, 30 minutes. Um, characters violating the most basic single characteristic of their character as has been established for the last 25 years. Mm -hmm. Cavalierly, without any explanation. Um, and again, you can do that. You, you, it's your universe. You can do whatever you want with it. I'm I'm not going to yell at anybody who's who made them very happy and, and joyful and they love uh, porgs <laughs> and they love to collect porgs. Now, that's fine. There's nothing wrong with that. But for me, I looked at it from two points of view. One is from, oh, it's, this isn't science fiction. This is mm -hmm. a um, a bunch of little fantasy vignettes designed to check certain boxes that the people wanted the audience to have. Mm -hmm. That's fine. Um, the question then becomes, well, now you have a third movie, supposedly. You've left everything in ashes. <laughs> uh, what do you do now? This is, this is I'm, I'm worried about the, um, uh, what am I thinking of? The, uh, the moment from misery, mm -hmm. you know? How did they get out of the cock and duty car? <laughs> you know? it's, I'm, I, it's because there's, it doesn't make you, you set this up in a, such a way that there is a literal cliffhanger. And at the end of the, at the literal cliffhanger, I don't know if you saw misery, Kathy Bates, this is a Kathy Bates line where she expresses her profound disappointment at, at this series of this sort of adventure story. She would go see on Saturday mornings at the movie theater. You know, they're locked in the car, the car's welded shut, and the car's going off the cliff, and the car's on fire, and the hero's in peril, and, and the dog is weeping, and the girlfriend is crying, and come back next week to figure out what happened here. And the next week, they're all fine. Yeah. <laughs> There's no explanation of how it happened. There's no explanation of how they got out of the car. They're just all dusting each other off. Well, that was a close escape. Let's move on to the next adventure. That's what this was. There's mm -hmm. no explanation for why the person in charge of this franchise decided to get rid of everything to do with the past trash every rule they've established, make characters do the exact opposite of what those characters were supposed to do. Um, and the only thing I could liken it to in my own in, in um, my own experience, just watching a movie going, huh, was the first uh, Mission Impossible movie. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Because Phelps to. was a bad guy. Because Phelps was a bad guy. Now, you can make Phelps a bad guy, but the whole predicate for the TV series was that Mr. Phelps is absolutely mysterious and completely incorruptible. Mm -hmm. That's that's not a throwaway. That is the foundation of the fucking story. So suddenly announcing ha a third of the two thirds of the way through the movie, ha ha, the villain <laughs> is the good guy. <laughs> we fooled you. Well, of course you did because you violated every basic plot element of this story upon which it has been built. Well, yes, fuck right. you. Then it's just. Let, oh, then anything can happen anytime and anyone without any understanding of why they did it. And that really just sort of left me stunned. Like, well, wait a minute. That's, you know, it, it's, it's Superman is secretly a villain. The mm -hmm. Superman is secretly, all this time he's been secretly Lex Luthor. Isn't that amazing? Well, you could do that if you own the property. It, it is incredibly disrespectful <laughs> to the property that you've inherited. And it certainly doesn't explain, okay, now you have to do retroactive continuity. How do you explain all the things that happened all along the way that now make no fucking sense at all if this new thing is true? Well, I don't have to. Yeah. Because porgs. <laughs> and or, porgs are or, yeah, because they can travel across the galaxy because we said so. Yeah, everything's, right. And everything's possible. Anybody can do anything. And it's not that it, it lacks beautiful scenes because they're beautiful scenes. But really, if you if you... Go into it expecting a, a plot and character developed movie that moves forward. And I'm trying, I really am trying not to spoil anything. I'm trying really hard to do that. Uh, then you're going to be roundly disappointed because you're expecting a traditional kind of story structure. If you go in expecting a series of very lovely tone poems, um, uh, works of, of, of paintings, uh, infused with frankly way too much heavy handed politics. Even for yeah. me, and I'm, I'm, you know, if you want to have a political message, you can do it. It's called Casablanca. Yeah, yeah. Um, but yeah. don't go through Casablanca going, Nazis are bad. We mm -hmm. should defeat them. There's a certain kind of subtlety to it. It's called storytelling. So um, I get the messages, and I agree with most of them. But everything seems kind of jammed in sideways, and as if it's like, ah, eh, fuck it. We we hit the deadline. This is what we've got. It looks good. Um, let's go. Let's let's do it. And uh, I so I can appreciate it from a, a, a cinematography point of view. 
I can appreciate it from a uh, uh, aesthetic point of view, uh, but I had to leave my storytelling hat at home or I would have gotten very, very sad mm-hmm. at what they did uh, for no reason. I can't understand why they did the things they did. If, if there are reasons to violate core plot um, elements, you got to tell me what it is. You've got to, you know, you've got to show. Uh, you, there has to be other than just, well, look, shit, now that's the way things work now is not a sufficient explanation for a real good story. But I have a feeling that telling a, a whopping good tale wasn't what they wanted to do. So uh, it's it's Disney's property. They can do whatever they want with it. Um, it looked pretty. I'm probably not going to see it again because I don't know why I would. There are some lovely scenes in it that uh, are, are great. There are inexplicable things that characters do. Uh, and all in all, uh, it's not science fiction. That's the Science Fiction University lesson for today. Hey, thank you, Drift Glass. Your blue gal. All right. And everybody, we'll be back next week. And I don't know if we'll have Science Fiction University or not. This might have been a one-off. I don't know. Um, we've it's... heard a lot from a lot of people that they missed it, so we wanted to give you yeah. something for the end of the year. We, Hang we in have... there. We're we with you. To... We still have some stuff in the, in the, in the drawer. So. Yeah, and also I did want to say um, – there was a tweet a couple weeks ago, maybe I mentioned this, about, man, I, we'll end on this, about uh, can you handle another year of Trump? Mm-hmm. And I was so pleased to see people say, oh, yeah, we're in this to, to defeat it, to defeat right. what's going on. And then we have to rebuild. And so that's where we are. You know, we know that podcast listenership will ebb and flow based on what people are doing with their lives. Sure. A lot of people listen to this show every week, and we love you for that. Uh, you know, come come the time when there's Democrats in power and we're looking at, uh, you know, hopefully competent leadership rebuilding and some weeks are going to be slower than others, and that will happen. Sure. I think that will happen where we won't be exhausted all the time by the latest crazy tweet from nut job president stupid you know then we'll do other things we'll do science fiction university some more yeah we did not plan to each other we have lots of things to talk to each other yeah (laughs) this this is not as as is true of i'm sure everyone listening Mm -hmm. this is not what we thought we'd be doing this year absolutely not we had we had very big complex plans uh a a whole like a whiteboard with a lot of (laughs) flow chart shit on it every week this is exactly how we're going to move our our massive new media empire forward (laughs) um and turns out uh, basically uh, to use the the casablanca metaphor we're now running rick's cafe yeah and we're running a little saloon at the edge of occupied territory yeah uh, yeah. Where a lot of refugees stop for a drink and a song and someone to talk to. Mm-hmm. And we're happy mm-hmm. to do it. Yep. Because that's where we wound up. Yep. Yep. All right, Gin Joint. Uh, thank you very much. <laughs> and, Love you, darling. Uh, we'll see you guys next week. Bye. Bye. <laughs>